Welcome to the Idea Climbing Podcast. Today, the topic is Beat Your Brain Bully, How to Master Your Mind and Manifest Your Mission with my guest, Lynn Smith. Lynn is a national media expert and former anchor for NBC News, MSNBC, and CNN Headline News. A seasoned speaker and moderator, Lynn uses her voice on stage to discuss some of the most important topics of our time in a thought-provoking way. Currently, she advises corporations and individuals on how to tackle their greatest communication challenges, craft a compelling story, and take that message to powerful platforms in the media. Lynn is also the host of Stroller Coaster, a parenting podcast created by Munchkin Inc., an author, wife, and mom to two young active boys. We dive into topics such as why just pushing your brain bully away won't work, how to create a brain buddy and use it to your advantage, how and why you have complete control over which thoughts you focus on, and more golden nuggets of advice. You're going to love this show. Welcome to the Idea Climbing Podcast. Today we have Lynn Smith, as I mentioned. I'm so happy to have you here, Lynn. Thank you so much for making the time. Oh, I'm excited to be here, Mark. And we're going to talk about one of my favorite titles, and I have to give you credit for writing it. <laughs> Beat Your Brain Bully, How to Master Your Mind to Manifest Your Mission. Before we get into the strategies and the steps of doing that, because so many people have that, it, we're going to talk about imposter syndrome, a few other things. How did you discover it? What's your story with beating your brain bully? Well, let's start with what is the brain bully, right? So the brain bully is that voice we all have in our mind that's saying, what if I screw this up? Or does Mark like what I'm saying? Or what if the audience thinks I'm a total idiot, right? So I realized after coaching hundreds and hundreds of executives, after being a news anchor for 15 years where I had my own brain bully incidents many and many times, I realized almost 100% of us have a brain bully. If you don't, then you're likely a sociopath or a narcissist. <laughs> and no offense to all of you out there, but it was just so common that I thought to myself, we have to create something in order to help us overcome it. And I dug internally in order to do that because as a news anchor, I was told all the time to my face, we're not talking internally, I was told you're not good enough, you'll never make it in TV. And then I had my own internal loop. Maybe, I, maybe they're right. Maybe I'm not good at this. So I had to create techniques. And I didn't realize I was doing it into a methodology, but I had to create techniques to overcome that in order to sustain a career for that long in television. And so now when I share it with executives, it's this light bulb moment that, oh, I shouldn't ignore this voice. This voice is actually not real or right. I just have to tame it. I have to know how to manage my brain bully. And so that's what I'm excited to talk to you about today. So how did you do it? I mean, initially, how do you, because that track can be so powerful and so loud in your head. What did you do to like pump the brakes on the voice? Yeah. So initially early on, I mean, I was in my early twenties when I started in television, right? So it was just pure grit and tenacity. It was pure, like, just keep going. That's sort of the three words I share a lot. Um, just keep going. You, you sometimes don't have any reason or logic. You just have to push through it. There's no other option. And so early on, I had to do that. And then throughout seeing what good came from pushing through my brain bully, I realized, well, now I can just sort of have fun with this and I can talk to my brain bully, right? So I can mm -hmm. say brain bully, and I actually encourage people to name their brain bully, right? Like what's the first name that comes to mind when you hear that voice? Literally the first name that comes to your mind. George. Why George? I love it. <laughs> I don't know why, but I think it was exactly. a Bugs Bunny cartoon. <laughs> my little exactly. George, I'll love you and keep you. So George, let's go with George. There you go. So every time that that voice comes in, Mark, I literally want you to be like, oh, hey, George, you're here, right? And parent almost yourself out of the situation. So what would I say to my kids? I have an eight and five-year-old. What okay. would I say to them if they had a bully, right? I would say, you know, somebody that doesn't say nice things to you probably doesn't feel good about themselves. Or, you know, if you listen to everything people had to say about you, you would never be able to do anything, right? So you you have to literally name it and then tame it. So you tame it by having those conversations with it. And then I tell people, reframe it. Like 
that brain bully could actually be an asset to you because it's going to keep you on your toes, right? Mm -hmm. Like we don't want to get complacent. We don't want to not have those butterflies in our stomach. They give us energy. It's just when we lose control of it is when we have some problems. That's really the key. And then it's really important that we aren't embarrassed by it. Like, let's all admit it. We all have one. Mine's Bob. I say it's Bob because my son got a fish for Christmas and he named him Bob. And I thought that was hysterical. (laughs) So every time I go into a situation where I'm unsure of myself or I feel like I'm really going to screw something up, it's like, Bob, sit down, watch this. And you almost are like performing for your brain bully. And, you know, I talk about this and all of this is because, Mark, I coach executives, entrepreneurs, coaches to be great communicators. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is that the thing that was holding them back wasn't that they were missing some of the ways that we are great communicators, like enunciation and sincerity and maybe the formula for sound bites that I share Mm -hmm. with people, but it's that they were in their head because I stopped them and I'm like, what's going through your mind right now? Because I can tell Mm. you're having a hard time communicating with me. (laughs) And they'll say, I'm worried about whether you think this sounds okay. I'm thinking, and I'm like, it's all the brain bully. So if we can overcome the brain bully, and that's why I say you'll be able to manifest your mission, you really are able to go out there and do what it is that you are meant to do. We all have our purpose of what it is that we're here for. If that's to create a podcast, if that's to create a keynote, a book, or whatever it is is that sort of that higher calling than whatever your profession is, Mm. what is that thing that's holding you back? And probably a lot of the times it's the brain bully. So how do you, I'd I'd like you to unpack this part a little bit more you stop it, you talk to it, you name it. How do you initially, at least, and even ongoing, how do you keep it from coming back? Because I can see, you know, snapping myself out of it in the moment while I'm giving a speech or doing a podcast interview. But then later in the day, it's like creeping back in. How do you keep it away? Stop it and keep it away. So that's the key. The mistake that people make is they push it away. They keep pushing it and keep saying, just get away, just get away from me. The reality is, is this is how our brain works, right? So our brain was designed to protect us from harm. Mm -hmm. You can either, you know, fight, flight, or freeze. That's the way our brain was created. So it really was created for survival. If a tiger is attacking us, it has those, those mechanisms in place. Well, Keynotes were not created when we <laughs> we became <laughs> humans. So it doesn't know the difference between you giving a big presentation and you being attacked by a tiger. Your brain's just protecting you from what it is viewing as a threat because of what your fears are. And so if you invite that in and you continuously have those conversations like, Bob, sit down, watch this. And I want to encourage your listeners to say, okay, and then how can I reframe it, right? Mm -hmm. So if I can reframe my brain bully into a brain buddy. So the the best communicators out there have a version of themselves that is the peak when they're on stage. I interviewed Brene Brown at a Mom 2.0 conference, and she shared with me she's pretty much a massive introvert. And I thought to myself, like, that's impossible. She's out there on every major stage. Her TEDx or her TED Talk is the biggest TED Talk of all time. How is that possible? And it's because she has a brain buddy that she gets up on stage and is able to become. It's not inauthentic. It's part of who she is. But it's the same as a Sasha Fierce to a Beyonce, right? Mm -hmm. So if we can reframe that brain bully every time it comes up, every time it starts coming in and George is like, oh, Mark, this is really going to flop. Okay, Mark, watch or okay, George, watch this. And you bring in that brain buddy and you say, what thoughts can I control? I want to share with your audience a a doctor that really influenced my teaching on this. So you hear a lot about manifestation and it sounds really woo woo. And there's a doctor, um, Dr. Don Wood, he has the Inspired Performance Institute. And he now is coaching pro athletes, pro golfers, high level CEOs into, you know, a a real like mindset of performance. And what he realized is that many of them were in their own way purely by what's going on in their mind. It's your thoughts. And he, he describes part of our anatomy, which is the reticular activating system. Mm -hmm. So the thoughts that are in the back of our mind 
move to the front of our mind, which are decisions and actions, which lead to our outcomes. So if we're thinking our brain bully and George comes in and is like, Mark, you're going to really screw this up. And you let that fester and you don't manage it or tame it then those thoughts will impact our actions and our decisions and our outcomes into what we're fearing the most. So oftentimes when I ask people, and I do this through every single one of my exercises in my trainings, I'm like, what are you afraid of? Because if we don't say out loud what we're afraid of, it's just, again, festering back there with the brain bully. They're like fist bumping. And so usually when they answer that question, actually, I won't say usually, it's 100% of the time, it's a version of a fear of failure. And one of the ways that I help them through that is explaining the reticular activating system that the more you think about the worst case scenario, the more likely that outcome is. Mm -hmm. And what's the best part about that? Best part about that is that you have complete control of those thoughts. You just have to make that switch. And I, that happens to me sometimes when I'm waking up in the morning and I'm looking at my calendar and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have every single hour of today booked. And then I stop myself and I'm like, I'm going to reframe that thought. I am so grateful that that calendar is full and that I am able to make the impact that hopefully I will make today. And that is such a gift that I have a full calendar because what if I looked at my calendar and mm -hmm. it was black and had nothing on it? And those thoughts are so very powerful. So I would challenge the theory, how do we make it go away? How do we just push it away? Because I think that's part of the problem is everyone's just trying to make it disappear rather than taming it. Well, I get it in times of stress to have a brain buddy and uh, get, you know, get you over that hurdle, whatever it might be. Is it only in times of stress do you talk to your brain buddy or what is it? Do you have dialogues with your brain buddy even when you're in good moods to reinforce a good mood? What does that look like? Stress, good mood, somewhere in between? I would say whenever the brain bully comes up. So sometimes that's just in a hard parenting day, right? Like, gosh, I really suck as a mom. <laughs> oh. And I have to maybe not. No, that happens in parenting where you just kind of feel like I'm screwing this up. And you have to maybe not bring in the brain buddy, but reframe those thoughts of, no one's ever going to be perfect. If you strive to be perfect, you fail 100% of the time. So I think that it, while I talk about it in the professional setting, because I see that if you can overcome some of these limiting thoughts in your mind, you can be what it is that you want to be on camera, on stage, on a mm -hmm. podcast, in a book. You can show up as your most authentic self because the things that are holding you back no longer have so much power over you. But I've seen how many other places in my life when I'm able to manage those thoughts that I'm able to redirect, help things get back on track and maybe not go down that spiral that maybe puts us out for a couple of days where we're just like meh or just feel ick. Yes. And that doesn't have to be that way. And I'm not being overly optimistic. I'm being very realistic. That doesn't mean that you can't have bad days. It just means that you're in complete control of how that bad day goes and where the direction is taken. Talk more about reframing. What are, are there steps to it, a structure to it? Because that is, sounds so powerful. And it seems like, and tell me if I'm on point with this too, it could be a snap of the fingers to start the reframe. But talk a little bit more about how do you reframe it, especially when you're stressed and that's what in the brain bullies taking over. Yeah. And so that's that step that I was talking about where it's, Bob, sit down, watch this. And it's taking that moment and it's almost like diffusing the power of it. And it's taking control, not pushing the brain bully away. It's taking control, sitting it down, and then delivering what you want to deliver. So I have a framework when it comes to how to prepare for any high stake comms, right? We prepare these talking points. I have four of them that we go through and they're in my program. And when you go into a high stakes communication situation and you have that preparation, you will feel confident. The problem is that the brain bully comes in and tells you, oh, wait, you're going to screw this up. And then you forget your, your talking points. And you're like, wait, what was I here talking about? Why am I rambling on? So if you are able to do that taming, that maintenance of just sit down, watch this, and then deliver mm -hmm. on what you've prepared, you see such a significant difference. It is that reframe, that power shift from I'm in the the passenger seat to I'm in the driver's seat. And you see it, you feel it. It's a transition that you see in people. 
And when you say sit down and watch this, is there is that does that mean you're taking immediate action to prove the brain bully wrong? What does watch no, this? No, I almost think it's like performing for the brain bully. It's like, watch, watch what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make this happen. I'm going to deliver what it is I'm here to deliver. I'm taking back control. So I use that phrase because that's really effective for me and my clients. But is there a phrase that works better for you? Like, hey. I'm going to do this, whether you like it or not. So mm. have a seat, <laughs> right? Have a seat, take a seat, whatever that word is that resonates for you. For me, it's sit down, watch this. And I can almost feel this shift for myself when I'm about to go on stage, because for me, it was really public speaking was a okay. challenge because I love the camera, but you put me on a stage and it's very different. And so I'm having to, right before I go on, like, oh my gosh, what if my voice starts to shake? Da, 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 da. I'm able to um, even visually put Bob into the audience, sit down, watch this, and walk there up on stage and get refocused, reframe my thoughts into what I'm there intended to do. So, I mean, you're the expert in this. We're talking about it because of that. Is this an ongoing thing throughout life? Do you ever just beat the brain bully and you're done? Or is it something you have to work on consistently? So I have found that beat the brain bully means that you have this system in place. You know what to do when it comes up because life is not linear. You don't just continuously have the same problems. You overcome them and there are no more problems. Mm. There's always new challenges. There are always new encounters, always different scenarios that all of a sudden you're not in your comfort zone anymore. So there's a new way for the brain bully to show up, but you know what to do when it does. So you know how to reframe those thoughts and you know how to claim it and you know how to tame it. And all of a sudden you're showing up and you're like, you know what? A, a situation that might feel really uncomfortable, uncomfortable to me before. Mm -hmm. Now I'm like, okay, I can do this. I know how to handle this. The key is that you're not keeping yourself on the sidelines as a result of the brain bully. I think so many people stay on the sidelines and they're just mm -hmm. like, they're sitting in those thoughts. They let the brain bully or they it's not that they don't have the brain bully. It's the brain bully's winning on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. And when you are able to tame it, that's when you can walk out and say, okay, I'm going to put myself out there and do a podcast, even though it feels uncomfortable, or I'm going to start recording social content, even though I feel so cringe when I start hitting record, <laughs> or I'm going to nominate myself for a speaking engagement, or I'm terrified of public speaking. Those are the types of things that people will soon feel empowered to do once they are out of their own head. <laughs> <laughs> Once oh. they are not thinking of all of the potential failures that have happened. You know, Mark, something that surprised me so much is when I asked that question, what are you afraid of? And 100% of the time, it was a version of a feeling of failure. So it could be, what if I look stupid? What if I say the wrong thing? You know, I coach a lot of executives when it comes to earnings. So what if I say the wrong thing on a CNBC interview is a big deal? It's not something to just pretend, oh, well, it's okay if you say the wrong thing. No, it's not okay. <laughs> but <laughs> that fear of failure, why is that so deep? I kept thinking to myself, I'm like, you know, we have all these quotes from the Michael Jordans of the world that are like, I missed more shots than I made. I was cut from the team. Like we've been told in social media and society that failure is actually something that that good comes from, but we hmm. still have it as our greatest fear. Why? <laughs> oh. And I think it's because of the brain bully. It's because it gives us all of the scenarios and it prevents us from seeing that big picture, which is Failure really is exciting because it's one step closer to success. I know this to be true because I've failed so many times <laughs> in my life and my career. Yeah. So many times. I would never, ever, ever have gotten anywhere close to where I got to in my career without letting myself fail and accepting it and pushing through it. Well, and then it's, is this an, tell me if I'm on point with this one too. It sounds like you're almost saying you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. I mean, does that apply to this scenario? 
I think definitely when it comes to the fear of failure, you have to allow yourself discomfort. If you felt comfortable in any everything, you're doing the wrong things. <laughs> like that's just <laughs> the case. You, If you are like, oh, this feels great, then you are not growing, you are not expanding, you are not scaling. It is impossible to go through those things without discomfort. So I think every entrepreneur, which I would assume are a lot of the people that swim in your circle and may yeah. be listening to this, yeah. If you're an entrepreneur, you cannot exist without discomfort. It's how do you handle discomfort? What do you do when it happens? And do you look at it as fuel or do you look at it as like a you know big bucket of water just pouring over your head? So it's really reframing what that discomfort looks like. To me, if I'm doing something uncomfortable, it means like something good potentially could come through or it could be a colossal failure. I'm willing to take that risk. And I don't know about you if uh, this is how I calculate risks in business, right? So I take a big risk financially or time-wise, whatever it is. And I look, what's the best case scenario Mm -hmm. and what's the worst case scenario? And if I can live with the worst case scenario, then it's a risk worth taking based on the best case scenario. So if I know that this is really something that could be amazing and the worst case is not something that's going to put us under, then it's a risk worth taking. And so that discomfort is going to come along with any type of risk. So I, I, I don't like this word in some scenarios, but it might apply here. Is that looking at a realistic worst case scenario and not an overblown one in your head? That's right. That's not a brain bully worst case scenario. Like my whole career is over because I bombed at a keynote, which actually happened to me. I oh. bombed at a keynote um, and and it prompted probably a lot of these teachings. Um, and it is that necessary, just massive fall on your face. So embarrassing. But I use it in order to show people that's not the end of the world, right? Like, it, it actually began many of my teachings. It informed my audiobook. It is now how many of my clients connect to me because I have had this happen to me and it did end up being the best case scenario because it it helped my business, right? Nice. Um, and, and so I, I really would encourage people to, when they are looking at that worst case scenario, really be logical about it and, and come at it at a lens of like, what is the worst that could happen? Financially, mm-hmm. can I take this hit? Um, time-wise, can I recover when it comes to finding new clients if I take a different business venture? All of those different scenarios have to be really thoughtfully examined from a lens of reality, not a lens of fear. We've covered a lot of ground in a short period of time. As far <laughs> as beating the brain bully, some said, I get it. I love the four steps. A lot of what you're saying about reframing, especially if you were to say, you know, if you're going to if you're going to get started and at least do this one thing above all, at least do this one thing to get rolling. What would you tell people to do? To get the ball rolling when it comes to facing Beating the brain bully, beating the brain bully. It is claiming it claim that you have one. I think so many people try and ignore it and they try and pretend like they're good at everything. And that's the root of imposter syndrome because everyone's Mm. saying, um, everyone's going to find me out. They're going to know that I'm a fraud because I'm putting on this like big confident face. Like I've got everything covered. If you can claim and name and reframe and tame your brain bully, and not be embarrassed by it and say like, this is what it is. 99.9% of us have it, then you will live in reality. You will not be living in fear. And that's the big, big, big difference. This has been awesome. If people want to find you online, online, where's the best place or places to go? Yeah. So lynnsmithtv.com is my website. And then on social, I'm at lynnsmithtv on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, LinkedIn, all the things. (laughs) It's been a great conversation, Mark. Thanks for the time. You're welcome. Thank you. This has been excellent. And scene. The scene. There you go. Boom. Boom. Thanks, Mark. That was fun. (laughs) It was definitely fun.